So we are all looking forward to your present, uh, your Q and A tonight, Sean. Thank you, Flanagan, who most of you know. A uh, warm welcome to you, Sean, and thank you for doing this Q and A for us and volunteering your time. Thanks, Sean. No, no, it's a pleasure. Um, so thank you to our host this evening. You also know Selena McNeil, audiologist and director of Healthy Hearing and Balanced Care and Independent Practice. Selene will put forward your questions you have already submitted and time permitting, we'll read out the questions you have written in the chat box. Thanks, Selene, for volunteering your time tonight. Cheers. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight. It is a pleasure to be the facilitator of another webinar organized by the Sydney Mania Support Group. And before we start, I would like to thank Anne Elias very much for all the work that she does to support those with Meniere's disease. Anne is the driving force behind all the group's activities. And as we know, she works tirelessly to organize different events and to disseminate information to help those with Meniere's disease to best manage their symptoms. So these are webinars that the Anne organized they are all available on the Meniere Support Group website, which is also managed by Anne. And they are great resources, not only for those who suffer from Meniere's disease, but also for us professionals. So I thank you, Anne, very much for your relevant work. Thanks. So yeah, as Anne I'd, said- I'd second that for sure. Yes. Thanks, Sean. So tonight's webinars will be a Q&A format. So as Anne said, we received 21 questions. So I organized the questions in topics to facilitate the flow. So Anne, if there's time at the end, we'll be happy to answer more questions as they come. So I will now introduce our guest speaker for the evening, which is a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sean Flanagan, who I have the privilege to know since he was a registrar at St. Vincent's Hospital where I worked at the time. Dr. Flanagan is today one of Sydney's top ENTs. He has a special interest in ear and hearing disorders, including Meniere's disease and tinnitus. Dr. Flanagan is a very skilled surgeon. He has performed cochlear implant surgery in many Meniere sufferers with very good results, I must add. His main consulting rooms are in Darlinghurst, but he also consults in Miranda in the Sutherland Shire and operates from St. Vincent's Hospital, from Sutherland Hospital, St. George Hospital, and Carina Private Hospital. So Sean is a very busy man, and he took uh, some time off tonight to answer some questions. So very welcome, Sean. Thank you. It's a, it's a great honor to, to at least try and help out um, uh, a very difficult, uh, uh, well, not always, but often a very difficult uh, disease process. Yes, indeed. So shall we start with the questions? Yeah, absolutely. So I, have, I have three questions that, that are related to cause and comorbidity. So I think I'm, I'll read the three questions and then you can address the topic as a whole. Is that all right? Yeah, of course. Okay, so uh, one is given that sinusitis and hay fever are somewhat allergy related, according to some studies, is there a presumed assumption that the disease could be linked with allergy to some degree? So this is one question. The other one is, in your opinion, have you come across any many sufferers who also suffer from sinuses and hay fever, either before or after their first attack? And the third one is about autoimmune and allergies as being a cause of many disease. And the question is being raised because of somebody on the Facebook page who uh, has found that autoimmune drugs are helping him. So do you want to yep. make your comments on those? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, um, all good questions. And I, I think, I mean, I suppose in summary, my feeling is that um, many is, is probably not a single pro disease process. It's, a, it's an umbrella term really for um, a condition of inner ear instability. So the initial cause of that, well, some much smarter people than me, and you know, I think there's been some really good um, webinars discussing the, the underlying molecular uh, pathology. But the way I think about it is that the, for whatever reason, the, the inner ear has become unstable. 
Mm -hmm. um, and any form of stress on the body um, can then trigger off or amplify the instability of the inner ear. And I think um, allergy is one of those many um, uh, inflammatory processes. Um, and I mean, a lot of a lot of you will notice, you know, particular uh, change in season um, uh, can be a trigger of a many years episode or a, or an um, increased instability of the inner ear function. So uh, I think there's little doubt that um, allergy can play a role. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's a major one, uh, to be honest. Um, and again, we can all. Um, pick out percentage uh, uh, numbers um, and depending on uh, what paper you read or what textbook you open up, you'll find anywhere from 10% to 80% of uh, Meniere's uh, sufferers will have a, an allergic um, component to the disease process. Uh, my feeling is in a significant way, it's probably at the lower end of that, that spectrum. Um, and sinusitis as well. I mean, you, sinusitis, again, is a broad term of inflammation of the paranasal sinuses, and it can be often allergically driven. It can be um, infective. Um, and often a lot of sinusitis um, is, in fact, not necessarily sinusitis per se, but uh, migraine related. So certainly um, if we're dealing with facial pressure, pain, um, retroorbital discomfort, then even though we often label that as sinusitis, often it's a it's a migraine uh, related uh, condition, um, and I'm sure we'll get into that a bit later. But there's a I think there's a very strong uh, correlation or link, or is it even part of the same uh, spectrum of disorder between uh, many years and uh, and uh, migraine uh, sufferers? Mm -hmm. So I mean, in in summary, even if we don't think it's a, an absolute or, or a major problem, like everything in many cities. I, I think um, we need to really aggressively treat and minimise any form of irritational inflammation in the body, and that includes allergy, uh, recurrent infections, what, whatever it may be. So um, I think, you know, if there's even a minor link between a, an allergy, whether it be inhalant or, or food-related, then getting on top of that is a very important part of stabilizing, you know, the overall physiology. Good. And what about autoimmune disease, Sean? Yeah, well, again, I, I think one of the many causes of, um, of uh, many diseases is, is likely to be autoimmune in, in, in type. And again, the way I think about it is that, um, 20 years ago, of, of all autoimmune disorders, we had maybe three or four blood tests. Now we have about, you know, three or 400 different blood tests. And, you know, fast forward another 20 years, we might have three or 4,000 basically. So, uh, and I suppose autoimmune disorder is just the body attacking itself. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think the, the link between Meniere's disease and systemic autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, SLE, um, systemic sclerosis, and, and those sort of things, I think is relatively uh, rare. Um, now, obviously, like anything, if you've got an autoimmune disorder, um, that's a significant uh, stressor on the body. And it's likely if that's out of control, Meniere's, it's likely to flare up the Meniere's disease. So uh, I think. Um, the, uh, the the treatment with autoimmune uh, or um, uh, immunosuppressive drugs, I think, are more likely stabilizing the formal or the systemic autoimmune disease, but it secondarily is helping the Meniere's disease. So it would be very rare for us to think about using a autoimmune drug um, or a, an immunosuppressive drug. Um, as a primary treatment for Meniere's disease if there's not another systemic disorder. Now, having said all that, um, and the obvious, the, the elephant in the room here is steroids, so prednisone, dexamethasone, et cetera. This is a auto, an anti-immune drug. So it's an immunosuppressive, um, and it has a role to play in Meniere's management. Um, it's certainly not curative, um, but uh, a lot of you may have had uh, previous experience with systemic 
um, oral or injectable uh, steroids or even um, steroids injected directly into the ear. So we're still not sure how steroids work, if they do work in, in Meniere's disease, but at least part of that will be affecting um, the uh, an autoimmune type uh, process, but it may also be affecting the sodium potassium balance within the inner ear. So I know that's a long-winded answer to, um, I think it's a it's probably in uh, an, a localized autoimmune disorder if if it happens. Um, it's I think it's rarely associated with uh, systemic autoimmune disease. And if it is, the instability of the autoimmune disease is having a secondary effect on the inner ear. Good. Very good. Um, I, I don't know what your thoughts are, Selene, but um, uh, you know we, we all see different, um, and everyone out there has has a diff, almost a different um, mix or pattern of uh, of many years. So it's very hard to um, to 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 make a blanket statement. Very very sure. Very very true. So um, let's move to the next one. That's about progression of many years disease. So somebody asked how many many years sufferers only go partially deaf and symptoms never progress to severe. Yeah, that's a hard question. I think I think that's an easy one to answer. In in that um, it's only a, um, a small percentage of uh, patients that do progress to significant hearing loss. So uh, and I suppose the people the people that we see. Um, are the thin ed edge of the wedge. So I think a, a high percentage of patients, um, their disease is mild. Uh, it doesn't progress. Uh, is often controlled um, by relatively simple measures, lifestyle modifications, maybe dietary, maybe occasional medications or whatever. Unfortunately, it's the, the people um, who get significant disease Probably represent somewhere between you know fifteen or twenty percent of all many ear sufferers, mm -hmm. um, and like I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, aware um, part of the problem there lies in diagnosis as well. So um, uh, anyone who's had vertigo or maybe some tinnitus or hearing loss, uh, maybe not so much now, but in the last twenty years, uh, often people were labelled as many ear disease, and in fact you know, weren't weren't actually many ear sufferers, but had another disease process or a, or a single episode um, that never progressed. But having said that, I think uh, only a relatively small uh, percentage of patients will progress to more significant symptoms. And do you think you can predict who these people are? Because I think that's the difficult, the difficulty <laughs> of this question. Because... Yeah, I, I, I think the answer is no. Yes. Um, it is very, very difficult. Um, uh, I mean, p potentially, I suppose, people who are otherwise very healthy, younger patients um, without any other comorbidities probably have a slightly lower risk of progression. Mm -hmm. um, but that that that's helpful if you're um, looking at thousands of people as an individual turning up to discuss um, uh, symptoms with your doctor or audiologist or whatever, it becomes very difficult to predict. And that 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 sense of uncertainty is one of the, the major problems in managing many of the disease for, for, for everyone. Absolutely. So the other, the other question related to progression is, is burnout real? And there's another question on the same topic. It, if many attacks are controlled and reduced with diet and drugs so that they become infrequent, does that delay burnout or have any other known long-term benefits or issues? So yeah, um, I, I, there's no doubt burnout is real. Um, uh, the problem is, you know, you might read a textbook or a, a or a common description that there's a set number of phases and burnout will go, or the disease will go through one, two, three stages, and uh, at 15 years you'll definitely burn out. The problem is that burnout phase can go, it can can um, exist anywhere from six months to 60 years. So this is this is the challenge. Mm -hmm. um that you don't uh, i'd love to say to people well you know this is going to burn out i can guarantee it's going to burn out in a year's time just to hold tight um, survive until then um but that's that almost never happens mm -hmm. so um and the problem also with burnout is that um for, for different people it, it happens at a different 
set point. So some people might burn out with only very mild hearing loss and vestibular dysfunction, whereas uh, some people may burn out um, with uh, almost complete deafness and uh, an almost complete lo loss of vestibular function uh, and anywhere in between. Um, so, I mean, it might be sound slightly silly, but certainly um, medically induced burnout can happen. I mean, that's when, you know, people do have either a chemical or a surgical labyrinthectomy to essentially sacrifice uh, inner ear function. That will certainly burn the disease out but at the cost of potentially uh, inadequate compensation for hearing and balance loss. So um, they're, they're part of the really big decisions in, um, in end-stage many years management. Yeah, because I think what the question, what they're trying to ask here is, if you control the symptoms, if you're going to delay burnout, do you think there's such a thing? Uh, it's a bit the opposite, right? You can speed it up by intervention, but correct. Yeah. Yes, I think. Well, um, it's a good question. I mean, there's some argument that no matter what you do, the ear is going to end up where it's going to end up anyway. I think that's slightly fatalistic. You know, um, I think you know this is one of those things that maybe it's not completely backed up by science. But if we can, um, if we can control the symptoms, stabilize the ear then you would hope that in the long term, the, uh, the end point of the ear function is going to settle at a, at a much better level of functioning. Mm -hmm. Now, again, if you're a completely complete fatalist, well, maybe that's because that subtype of many is in that per particular person was never going to get particularly bad anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but at least it gives us some uh, hope or some uh, goal to get, um, to get the symptoms under control. Uh, with the um, the hopeful benefit of uh, minimising uh, long-term damage or loss of function. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next one is somebody who had a diagnosis of vestibular migraine to start with in 2005, and in 2022, he was diagnosed, he or she was diagnosed with many years following a significant cluster of attacks. Yeah. And it says, my left ear is good enough not to need a hearing aid at this point. However, the caloric tests didn't work with the usual hot and cold water and ice water was needed to generate a response. And the question is, does it mean the beginning, the middle or the end of many years journey? The fact yeah. that the calorics are only present with the ice stimulation. Yeah, so um, probably everyone's out there has had a caloric test, maybe, maybe not, but um, uh, the almost counterintuitive um, for those who haven't is that the more dizzy you become when we put water in the ear, the better the result in, in a weird way. That means that if we're putting um, water hot and cold into one ear and you get severe vertigo, that it means that the actual, the, the, at least the low frequency part of the vestibular function is, is still intact. If we need to put ice cold water in the ear to generate a response, it means there's a fairly significant degree of vestibular loss in that ear already. Now, there are many different uh, um, types of vestibular function test, and they're testing different parts of the vestibular system. So um, a caloric is not everything, but it, it gives us an idea of your, if you've got ice cold calorics only, it means there's a fairly significant degree of um, vestibular dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And if you're not getting any more vertigo attacks or very minimal, um, and the hearing is down but not fluctuating, you would assume pretty much that that, uh, that ear is heading or at the point of, of burnout or, or uh, very little active symptoms. Mm -hmm. So in, on the same line, there's a question if it is recommended to have caloric tests uh, like as a regular to monitor the symptoms or if it's just if symptoms get worse over time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you and I might differ slightly here, Seleni, but potentially I don't know. Um, my, my feeling about vestibular function tests, um, I, I don't run a lot of vestibular function tests. I think in my mind, the the goal of a vestibular function test is twofold. One is to help make a diagnosis in a difficult situation. 
Um, I, if we're trying to work out, is this meniere's, is it vestibular migraine, is it some other uh, disease process, or is it a combination of, of, of both or all of those? And certainly if we're looking at um, or considering a more aggressive um, medical treatment, so an ablative type surgery um, or, uh, or procedure, I think it's very important to determine what the underlying vestibular function is. Uh, on in both ears, in fact, you know, so probably even more in, important on the contralateral ear, and this will at least give us a, an idea. It's not definitive, but give us an idea of what kind of um, compensation uh, we can expect. Um, and we also, you know, think about doing that for non many ears patients, for instance, if people have a tumor, or if we're thinking about cochlear implants, etc. We, we want to make sure that we're thinking about not only the worst hearing ear, but also the worst uh, balancing ear. I think that's very important. But coming back to the beginning, I think routine or regular um, balance function tests, certainly caloric effect, uh, caloric tests, I, I don't think are really strongly indicated in that regard. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I don't think the caloric is necessary on a regular basis. But I think the VHEAT and the other tests might be useful. Yes. And yep. not so much on the diagnosis, but also in the management to help yep. with the management for the rehab of the vestibular system. Correct. I think, you know, one of the big things that, um, and I mean, Selene and probably most of you are very aware of, I think um, the overall management of many of these is, is, you know, the really important things are much more or should be much more focused on the rehab than the almost the medicine. I don't want to talk myself out of, out of a job, but I think it's the um, the interictal or in between episode vestibular retraining, whether that be with a vestibular physiotherapist, you know, good audiologist, uh, exercise physiologist, um, hearing rehabilitation in all in all sorts of forms, and you know, psychologic rehab, etc. Th these things are I think significantly more important than than medications and, and even surgical and, uh, and medical interventions, basically. So I think Selene was saying um, the V-HIT um, is, again, probably most people have had one, but it's really just testing um, how our, our brain, our eyes and ears communicate with each other, how they can stabilise our, our rapid head movements. Um, and it's a very simple, um, non-invasive test. And it can give us a, a really good idea of what kind of compensation has happened or maybe uh, we should be aiming for to optimise, um, uh, you know, day-to-day uh, -day functioning. Mm -hmm. So the other one is, can you explain drop attacks when they start and will most people have a drop attack? Okay. Um, my experience is most people won't have a drop attack. Um, if it does happen, it tends to happen really toward the end of um, the many years process. I think more often than not, you can, that's, there's always exceptions there. I think if you're looking statistically, it's slightly more likely to happen in older versus younger patients. Um, and if you can imagine um, uh, like a, uh, a many years attack involving the semicircular canal. So is this concept of the part of the ear that's being activated. If you can imagine the semicircular canals around, this might be overly simplistic, but basically you're stimulating the semicircular canals. The, the brain thinks you're spinning in a circular direction. We've got the utricle and the saccule uh, within the, the, um, uh, the inner ear balance system, and they dictate both um, uh, up and down and back and forth movements. So the utricle... Um, if that becomes uh, activated, it can cause a sudden loss of um, vestibular tone. So that's a drop attack. So you, you all of a sudden drop to the floor. What's really important um, is that there is uh, no loss of consciousness. So you, you need to be completely awake and aware um, when things are happening. Um, and then often, you know, you, you know, in a dangerous situation, you know, you can it can be a, a big issue. Uh, but often that's followed by the onset of a, a more classic a rotational vertigo episode. Now, the reason I say about this, um, about the importance of not loss of consciousness, 
is that we need to be certain that it's not a cardiac uh, or a primary neurologic event. So there's been a few people who've had Meniere's disease and have had um, blackouts or you know uh, sudden drops to the ground but lose consciousness for seconds to um, to minutes. Um, this needs to be aggressively uh, investigated um, not, um, by a cardiologist or neurologist. Um, they can be similar, but um, th there's no mechanism for the inner ear to cause uh, loss of consciousness unless you're really unlucky and you, you hit your head on the way down or something. But um, um, uh, that's that's something very important for us and, and you guys to be aware of. Yeah, don't just assume that was a drop attack. May not have been. Yeah. Thank yes, you. absolutely. Yeah. So this question here, I don't really understand, but uh, it says people talk about a very quick brain zap with many years. Mm. Is this common? And if so, what's happening? Yeah. Um, I, I think... Um, I mean, brain zaps or, um, and uh, that I suppose that could represent a whole range of things, but whether that's uh, pain or just a sensation of like an electric current going through the head or, or whatever, um, uh, I, I don't think it directly related to Meniere's disease. So uh, it's not an uncommon symptom. And if someone's describing those sort of uh, uh, sensations, um, apart from, like a, a whoosh feeling so like a a sudden you know feel as a whoosh the whole world spins around mm -hmm. i think i would start thinking about well is there a, a, an underlying headache component here or a neuropathic pain a type scenario all often can be married together but i don't think it's a it's a direct um uh consequence of many's disease per se yeah okay so now we move to management and treatment so uh, one question is, how much does diet contribute to the symptoms? Um, I, I think uh, maybe I'm a bit controversial here, maybe. I think it's important, absolutely. Um, and I think, uh, and a bit like in, in migraine as well, I think regular sensible diet um, and part of this includes sleep and a whole range of things. Um, there's no doubt that some people with many ears are acutely sensitive to salt. I think they represent a relatively small percentage of many ear sufferers. So um, I, I think we need to be um, sensible in that um, a super duper low salt diet is a very hard thing for most people to maintain anyway. So, I mean, everyone's probably heard of different levels of how many milligrams a day or whatever, but um, the traditional super low salt diet was was as low as 600 milligrams of salt per day. Um, I think that's almost impossible to sustain for most most people. Obviously, there's some super, super people out there that can do it, but I, I think that's very, very rare, to be honest. And my feeling is that it's probably more important to focus on a stability of diet we're talking about salt initially um, and avoid big spikes uh, than the than the actual um, total uh, milligram level and if you can sort of get below two maybe two thousand milligrams or something like that and keep that up uh, most of the time that will be um, if that's going to help then keeping it at that level i think is a reasonable uh, a reasonable goal um, I think we started back from allergies. I think there's probably uh, a very small subset of people who are maybe allergic or need to watch out some di other dietary triggers. Um, we also talk about um, caffeine, alcohol, et cetera. Um, I think they play a, a role uh, and it's probably not a huge role. Obviously, you don't want to get drunk and get um, every night and get completely um, dehydrated. I think that's probably the the effect mostly for alcohol, and similarly for for caffeine, um, it's a diuretic, and you can have um, it can affect your fluid shifts a little bit as well. Um, I think there's a big crossover with um, migraine, so being really aware or being uh, at least cognizant of um, uh, migraine triggers, um, and in migraine, um, it might be things like. Um, red wine, dark chocolate, tomato paste, the whole range of things uh, to be aware of. I think um, 
they're probably just as important as a lot of the many type diets uh, that we um, that we look at. So what about anti-inflammatory diets like gluten and dairy-free diets? Do you think, does it have a role to play? Uh, I think, uh, again, without being sort of too um, simplistic, I think if it's a healthy diet, I think if you're um, uh, um, uh, eating well, uh, like a, a broad um, balanced diet, uh, I think part of that is there's no doubt exercise is a really important part of this to improve overall physiology. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if people are feeling better on a gluten-free diet, they're not getting a lot of abdominal symptoms or whatever, uh, I think this is a, um, a positive effect on global physiology more so than maybe specific effects on the inner ear itself. So general, if you're improving general well-being, I think that's a much more important than the, the specific diet per se. Mm -hmm. And just uh, following on the coffee, uh, there's a question here, if decaffeinated coffee is okay. Yep. I mean, as someone who drinks way too much coffee, I, I, I'm always uh, nervous about telling people not to drink too much coffee. But I like a lot of these things. I mean, it, there's so many variables going on. But I think if, if you drink a coffee and then um, an hour later, you know, there's a reliable link to a flare-up of symptoms, et cetera, well, that's a bit of, that's an easy decision. Mm -hmm. If um, if you're drinking, you know, a coffee a day or whatever and you go through a cluster of many years episodes, um, to me that doesn't really seem to be an obvious trigger. So, yeah, absolutely, you know, decaf coffee I think is 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 fine. Obviously, there's a bit of caffeine in tea and, and various other things as well. Um, I think it's five cups of coffee a day that can, you know, really affect um almost your anxiety levels. I think that's probably more likely a effect than the, the compound of caffeine itself mm -hmm. and effects on sleep and, and other things I think is much more important. Okay, so the other question or there's two questions on the same lines. So the first one is during an attack, it can sometimes be around 10 to 12 days long, yep. which include vertigo and hearing loss and tinnitus. At which point do you seek medical advice, if any? Yeah. So there's another one on the same line. Yeah. Maybe I'll read another one. So having had Meniere's disease for over 12 years, and whilst I know the episodes will finish, I am never really sure during them if medical advice should be sought. GPs yeah. don't really know what to do, and it's hard to get a late appointment with your preferred ENT. It is known yeah. that attacks come in clusters. However, is there a point in the attack that one should seek medical advice? Yeah. I, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, and I think it's probably beholden upon all of us to um, almost have a, um, a plan in place. Um, so um, I suppose there are, um, again, maybe overly simplistic, but being aware of potentially uh, what might be the triggers, you know, what might be the um, the things that will lead to a cluster of, of, of attacks and obviously trying to minimise those. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, you know, if, if we are in the middle of a, a cluster, then um, there's a lot of experimentation. Um, everyone's going to react a little bit differently, but obviously having a plan of rescue medications in play, and that could be something... Uh, like an anti-nauseant and then a vestibular suppressant and then have um, the, a setup in place where you could potentially um, uh, lie down, uh, sleep it off, uh, essentially. Now, there are a number of different uh, anti-nauseants and a number of, um, of uh, suppressant anti-vestibular medications uh, that often require a fair amount of trial and error, depending on what what works. Um, we want to make sure it's not, it is purely many, it's not something else going on at the same time. And then uh, a whole range of other things, including um, uh, the acute use of diuretics, uh, and that can um, uh, include urea, which is sort of a bit out of fashion, but some people still have a benefit from uh, a prodrome of taking something to try and uh, stop it from progressing. Um, uh, there's a subgroup of people that will respond to steroids, so prednisone in an oral form. Um, occasionally, um, 
and this comes along the line of, you know, when do you seek medical attention? Well, I suppose if you haven't got an acute plan in place uh, that's working, um, occasionally then we would think about um, uh, an emergent uh, intratomatic dexamethasone uh, injection. Now, these occasionally work. It's not absolute by any means. Um, uh, even rarer still, um, if we're really struggling to control acute episodes, we might even think about um, putting a grommet in the ear and allowing uh, you to use uh, topical steroids into the ear um, uh, uh, every day for a, a series of days. So there are a whole range of very bespoke um, uh, treatment options uh, for people having um, clusters, uh, but it is a very personalised um, uh, treatment when it gets to that point. But yeah, the, the answer there is yes. Um, hopefully you can have a plan in place already and have an arrangement with um, with your treating physician to at least have a chat on the phone, email, uh, an acute um, or a an emergent appointment to see if we can um, uh, stop this uh, uh, cluster from happening and minimising ongoing damage. So and the other one is where does the ENT step in if one is bilateral? Yeah, well... I think um, probably um, the answer is that you'd step in anyway, whether it be unilateral or bilateral, I suppose. The thing about bilateral disease, um, potentially uh, it, it, it might modify some of the more aggressive treatments that we may use. I think um, it certainly makes rehabilitation even more important. You know, So if we're talking about balance retraining and hearing then obviously um you know if you've got one ear and you're running off the other ear from a hearing point of view well it's not perfect but um you can often survive if you've got both ears with uh, significant hearing loss or fluctuating hearing loss then hearing aids are going to be really really important um similarly with balance and vestibular retraining um that's also very important um but obviously, if you've got bilateral disease, it's going to affect your quality of life even uh, to a higher degree. So I suppose more aggressive medical supportive um, treatment becomes uh, uh, really, uh, really essential. So the next question is about uh, endolephatic sac decompression. So the patient, the, the, the question is, what is your view, knowledge, and experience in treating many symptoms with endolephatic sac decompression with clipping? Yeah. So I think the actual technique used, and again, um, we could probably, um, in this forum or uh, forum with some of my surgical colleagues, we could probably sit there for weeks and sort of argue uh, the point about what type of technique you use or whatever. My feeling is whether the uh, endolymphatic duct is opened, it's clipped, it's um, ablated or whatever, my feeling is the results are essentially the same. And probably what happens, I think, is that we are actually um, uh, destroying the endolymphatic sac. So the idea of draining, um, we, we used to, or occasionally people still leave a little silastic tube within the, um, the sac itself thinking that that would facilitate drainage of the endolymph from, uh, uh, from building up in the sac itself. My feeling is that when we do that, we open up the endolymphatic uh, sac and whether we drain it or not, I think what we're doing is destroying the normal function of the, the sac. So the idea of clipping it is stopping the, um, the hormonal uh, secretions from the sac into the endolymphatic uh, system. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I think an endolymphatic uh, operation, let's say, I think has a very limited role in, in many years management. Um, my, I would probably do maybe, I'm trying to think how many I did last year, maybe two or three per year, essentially. Um, and where does it fit in terms of the, um, the interventions? I think... Um, Patients with significant bilateral disease um, where there's still good hearing function and good balance function, but significant ongoing um, vertigo and hearing fluctuation. And the reason for that is um, 
at least in the very short term, it probably has a lesser effect or lower risk than gentamicin on hearing and um, maybe a slightly lower effect um, on or lesser likelihood of significant vestibular dysfunction than a gentamicin injection. I think medium to long term, if you look at some of Prof Gibson's long term outcomes, et cetera, I think probably the ear will um, often end up where it's going to end up anyway. So I think medium to long term, I don't often see it as a hearing preserving procedure, um, but certainly in the short term, and maybe we've got a slightly lower rate of vestibular dysfunction after sac surgery than we do with gentamicin. But it is a surgery. You know, there are. You know, in good hands, it's it's a low risk operation, but we are um, adjacent to the brain. There's small risks of um, you know brain fluid leak and and various other things. And certainly, it's not. An, uh, there's no guarantee whatsoever with um, with that as a as a procedure. So the next question is: uh, From your point of view, is it necessary to see a neurologist? Um. I think, is it absolutely necessary? No, but I think um, uh, certainly in, a, in challenging um, uh, cases um, and especially in those cases where migraine is playing a significant role um, in the management of uh, or in the, the symptomatology, then I think the answer is yes. And, and I, I certainly work very closely with... Um, a few of my neurology or neurotology colleagues in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, often, you know, part of that uh, is, and depending where you are in Australia as well. Um, now, if you've got um, highly trained and motivated audiologists that can um, perform appropriate and calibrated vestibular function tests, and not just a V head or a caloric, but the whole range of things, then sometimes. Um, that's not as important, but often in, in a lot of places in Australia, it's the neurologists who have the lab set up to do the formal and, and properly calibrated vestibular function test when, when needed. But in my mind, um, they can be, a, a neurology opinion can be very helpful in terms of working out how much is migraine, how much is many is disease. Is it some other central form of uh, vertigo that can be really severe but relatively rare? That um, as good as we think we are, um, we certainly don't have all the answers in that regard. Um, and there are some advanced testing that can be done to try and really nut out which is the active ear and which is not the active ear if we're really uh, having to make some hard decisions in terms of uh, intervention. Mm -hmm. So more in terms of differential diagnosis then, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. So the last question on the topic of management, I think you have already answered, but maybe just to wrap it up. So the question is, when you diagnose someone with Meniere's disease, what are your manage management tips for one to take with them? Medication yeah. or what you would, you would recommend? Yeah, I, I think um, the, because um, most patients who are uh, diagnosed with Meniere's disease most uh, patients will be able to control their symptoms um, with, let's call it globally lifestyle modification. So this, whether it be um, eating well, living well, sleeping well, you know, thinking well, a whole range of things. And that's before we even start with, you know, talking about medications. So in, in, in my mind, um, medications play a relatively small role in most many years management. Um, and again, we might be slightly um, fatalistic or negative about this, but if you look at all the data, um, uh, all the Cochrane reviews, and there's been a, a recent re-release of a whole range of different uh, Cochrane reviews, uh, there's no there's there's no overwhelming evidence that anything works, um, including diuretics, CERC, intratomatic steroids, oral steroids, um, nothing. So I, I think. That's a little bit fatalistic, and I think there's there's different subsets of people and, and disease processes that will respond to certain medications. Um, but I think it's lifestyle um, uh, management, physical, emotional, whatever it may be, is by far and away the most important thing. And whether that requires professional help in terms of um, balance retraining, um, 
psychologic, you know, um, a psychologist to talk about tinnitus, to talk about the feedback loop of anxiety and triggering in an episode, et cetera. Um, and often um, an overlooked thing is sleep. So um, if we're talking about stress being a trigger for Meniere's disease, which I think it is, the commonest physiologic stress uh, for most of us is uh, inadequate or poor quality sleep. And that can be um, sleep disorders, obstructive sleep apnea, whatever it may be. I think that's a very under uh, underestimated and considered uh, comorbidity in Meniere's disease. Yeah. Yeah, I always say, and it is true, the happiest of my Meniere's patients don't take any medication. Yes. Yes. Yep. Life Absolutely. And that's changes. easy to say on one level, of course. Um, um, but absolutely, I think um, uh, without being uh, talking myself out of a job, I'm being slightly silly. Um, I, I think the 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 role of medical management in many is 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 a very small one in the scheme of things. Okay, so now moving to the last three questions, and these are about tinnitus. So the first yes. one is, I can hear up to three different sounds at the same time with my tinnitus caused by Meniere's disease. Is this normal? One of the sounds is a pulsatile tinnitus. Should that be investigated? Yeah. So, um, in, and this might be overly simplistic, but I think the way I think about tinnitus is that um, you need to have some form of damage to the auditory pathway in order to have tinnitus. Mm -hmm. So, um, and people can have tinnitus with what looks like a normal audiogram. So often will happen in maybe not even many of these, but basically all comers with tinnitus, people will walk in and have a hearing test and, um, um, you know, good audiologists, but without a great degree of sort of interest in the area will say, you've got normal hearing um you know it's all in your head um just go away basically but even if you've got normal hearing um an audiogram is only a, a very superficial uh, assessment of uh, underlying auditory function so you can have a mild degree of hidden hearing loss or higher frequencies or whatever it may be and essentially if you've got a little bit of neural damage to the auditory pathways the brain and the ear will set up almost a leaking circuit so um, and these leaking circuits in the brain then uh, interconnect with other parts of the, the, the brain that control um, neck muscles, jaw muscles, limbic system or whatever. So again, it comes back to any form of stress on the body, whether it be physical, um, muscular, so sore neck, sore jaw, um, clenching your teeth can amplify it or whatever. Um, these things can modulate how the brain processes that sound. Um, and then in and of itself, tinnitus is annoying. It can affect sleep quality, state of mind, et cetera. And these, all these things can, in, um, unlike people, cause a feedback loop, and that can make the tinnitus worse. Mm -hmm. so I suppose in many is disease, if we're talking about that sort of multi-frequency tinnitus, um, it doesn't surprise me at all in that if you've got multiple frequencies of your ear with, with neural damage or whatever, then having different pitches of tinnitus, I mean, it makes sense to me. So uh, uh, in and of itself, uh, it, it's not a warning sign. Pulsatile tinnitus, mm -hmm. the answer is um, uh, all comers, if you've got pulsatile tinnitus, and we can be, uh, if we can really either hear it, so with a stethoscope or whatever, um, and it's in time with the heart, we can modulate it with um, blood flow, either arterial or venous, then yeah, probably an appropriate uh, X-ray or scan is important. Now, having said that, 95% of pulse adult tinnitus is related to the inner ear losing some of its um, uh, almost inherent noise cancelling ability. So if you can sort of, um, if you can envisage that carotid artery travels about a millimetre or two millimetres away from our cochlea, and that's pumping let's say three litres of, of blood per minute um, uh, to the brain. Um, and if, you're, if you sense that um, uh, a pulse adult tinnitus, most pulse adult tinnitus, and we see this in many disease probably more, more so than most, is that you're actually sensing some of your internal normal 
blood flow or muscular movements. So in and of itself, it's a yes, we probably need to think about investigating it, but almost always it's related to loss of um, some of the internal regulation of internal noises from the inner ear. Um, and if, if once that's the case, then the management of that tinnitus falls back to the same way we would manage any other form of um, constant sound tinnitus. So in other words, if you have many ears and pulsatile tinnitus, you don't have to worry too much about investigating. Yep, I think it almost always, I mean, we're almost always we've already run some form of imaging to rule out other things anyway. Yeah. So it's obviously really important to mention, et cetera, but in and of itself, uh, in my mind, almost always, it's just another form of the, the tinnitus related to uh, loss of inner ear stability. Yeah, which is quite common, the pulsatile and the many ears. Very common. Yes, yeah. So the other question I think you did answer because uh, the person says my tinnitus starts as a very low frequency tone and moved to a high frequency. Is this common in many years disease? Yeah, so as, as, as you've seen, Selene, and, and most people, obviously the, the, the hallmark of early many years disease is low frequency hearing loss. Mm -hmm. So that often, it's not always the case, but often... Uh, the tinnitus will reflect at least to some degree the frequency band or range of, of the damage to the inner ear. So as the as potentially the inner ear dysfunction worsens, it tends to spread to the high frequencies. So that's pretty pretty common and almost expected. Yeah. And the last question, Sean, are there any remedies to relieve tinnitus, especially at night when trying to assist with falling asleep? I don't want to mask the tinnitus with other noises. Okay. Um, okay. Let, let me be silly. Come back and see me in 40 years' time. <laughs> so, I, I mean, the, the ultimate treatment, obviously, of the tinnitus is, is to repair the inner ear um, dysfunction, essentially. So we're a long way away from that. Now, uh, I think the, the management really, uh, and uh, without being sort of too blunt, I think the whole nighttime thing is... Maybe let's not call it masking, but I mean, you don't want to completely um, mask out the sound, but you really want to stimulate the auditory system with a sound that is emotionally pleasant. Mm -hmm. So the brain can pick up or the auditory um, cortex can process that, that, that sound and help uh, habituate to the, the annoying or intrusive sound. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously, physiologically preparing yourself for sleep is really important. So um, exercise, lack of caffeine, close to bedtime, all these other factors, good sleep hygiene habits, all these things that um, sleep psychologists and other thing, uh, other people talk about, I think they're really, really important. Um, but uh, I think you know, sound enrichment, let's call it, I think is a very, very important component or part of uh, nocturnal tinnitus management, um, for better or for worse. I don't. I mean, what are your thoughts here? Um, Lenny, you obviously deal with a lot of people with, with tinnitus. What are your thoughts there? I do. Look, I think what you said is absolutely right. At this point in time, we treat sound with sound. That's the best option we have available. There's no remedy, yeah. no magic cure. Yeah. And I think, I mean, the idea of people talk about um, medications and a whole range of things, again, for, for tinnitus, I mean, there's a few supplements people talk about, but again, um, in my mind, none of them really work you know, directly. Now, um, some of them are, are indirect, you know, so if you've got super bad um, muscular pain, stiffness in the neck, you know, various other things, then some of the supplements, perhaps like my, uh, magnesium, et cetera, can help with muscle spasms, et cetera. Mm -hmm. so they will have a secondary effect on tinnitus management. You know, magnesium and, you know, can help a little bit with sleep. So th th those sort of things can be helpful, but I, I don't think they act directly on the auditory pathways that are generating the tinnitus in the first place. No, and especially in many years disease, tinnitus. Yes, indeed. The hearing loss. So we know yes. that fixing the hearing helps a lot. So when you put a hearing aid or a cochlear implant, it will help with the tinnitus. But unfortunately, yes. when you go to sleep or you try to sleep and you take that device out, tinnitus yes. back. And that's... Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. And I, I think the idea you mentioned about tinnitus control. I mean, often, um, often people will talk about 
um, well, my hearing is so bad, you know, um, I'm just going to put a hearing aid in, it's going to amplify distortion, et cetera. I think that almost always, even if you've got relatively poor speech discrimination, um, then a hearing aid appropriately, you know, tuned and, and modified by a, very, and a good audiologist can help with that sound enrichment scenario that can help with tinnitus management, um, even, even if it's not really helping so much from a hearing perspective. Yes, absolutely. And give sound awareness and also yep. brain plasticity. So even if the hearing absolutely. is very distorted to start with, the brain adjusts to the distorted signal yes. and makes some use out of it. Yep. It's not perfect. But, but it, it's always. hard work, you know, like, you know, like, like a lot of these things, um, you know, the, the brain has to get used to it. I mean, there's a lot of maybe almost silly ana analogies, but it's a little bit like, you know, you're not going to go to the gym and start lifting, uh, bench pressing 100 kilos a day. You know, you're going to start with maybe 20, 20 kilos and then, and this is working with your audiologist to sort of slowly increase stimulation to, 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 to the ear. Um, and then even if we're talking about end-stage cochlear implants, et cetera, then, um, I, I think a period of audiologic retraining, unless the ear is completely dead with the standard hearing aid, is a very important part of that um, of that rehab process. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So thanks, Sean. Thank you so much. It's three minutes to eight o'clock. You answered all the questions, all the twenty-one questions. So, and I can't see any questions at the chat here is there yeah, anything and i'm quite, actually quite not quite sure if it's working because of the technical issues we had but i think sean you've just answered most questions i'll have one more question so when would you recommend someone to get a someone with many years to a cochlear implant i mean who is eligible for one basically because that's a question a lot of the people here ask yeah of course so i think um uh, it's a pretty rare scenario you know obviously so for, for for the hearing to decline to a point where a cochlear implant is necessary or uh, or advised i mean statistically is, is is very unlikely having said that um the um, and this is i suppose for all comers um the indication for cochlear implant is if you've been fitted with the hearing aid well well fitted um, and has been uh, appropriately rehabilitated and you're getting less than 60 percent let's say of the words correct in a in a good aided uh, condition then from a purely audiologic perspective and if that if that's a stable hearing loss it's not fluctuating significantly and statistically we're going to get a better hearing result from a cochlear implant than a hearing aid. Now, in many as disease, um, because the, the damage is um, almost always um, localised within the cochlear itself, the cochlear nerve that's carrying the stimulation from the inner ear to the brain is normally pretty robust. So of all comers... Um, statistically, um, if the hearing is bad enough in Meniere's disease, we would expect a better than average result from a cochlear implant in Meniere's patients than we would for non Meniere's patients. Now, obviously, the significant issue in Meniere's is the balance and um, what's the residual function in the implanted ear, what's the function in the contralateral ear, um, and um, what are the risks of exacerbating or reactivating many disease in an ear that we're implanting? So the audiologic decision is very easy in my mind. And the, the same thing with, with in many disease from a hearing point of view, if you've got a hearing loss, wear a hearing aid. Um, and a cochlear implant in my mind is just another, another hearing aid. Um, but it does when we're actually making surgical decisions. Um, we 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 need to be really mindful of what the vestibular uh, function uh, is, could be, and and what's the result or the the risk of, of flaring things up by by performing an implant. Thank you, Sean. That's a good answer. Yeah. Yes.
Uh, can I ask about Valium? It seems to help me a lot. I have tried everything, Circ, Ginkgo, steroids. I still use urea when really bad and it works. And I am yes. sure it saved some of my hearing. I find my Meniere's disease is stress triggered and with mild sleep apnea, but was told by Professor Gibson that mild sleep apnea would cause attacks. So, yeah. Uh, comment, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, there's two things to say there is I think Valium is, is a very useful um, medication in the acute setting. So, you know, some people use Stemetil, some people use Valium, some people use Denarazine and the combination of all these things. So I think it's a very good vestibular suppressant. Um, uh, it's also a very good um, anti-anxiety drug. Well, it, it acts very well as an anti-anxiety drug. Um, and if used judiciously, um, and if you feel as though, you know, external stressors are a major trigger for a vertigo attack, and you can predict that and you can take a really small dose of Valium infrequently, um, then I think, yeah, it's a very useful tool in managing the severity of the disease process. The problem with that class of drug is um, that uh, you don't want to take it on a regular basis. Um, if you're taking, you know, like a, a five milligram uh, tablet of Valium three times a day, well, then fast forward three months, then you might need 10, then you might need so on and so forth. So it can become a physiologically addictive drug, but used uh, judiciously and appropriately, I think it's, 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 it, is a, it can be a helpful medication. And Sean hasn't even finished his day's work yet. Thanks, Sean, so much. No, it's a pleasure. Well, hopefully, the my, my registrar's closed the wound, and we can I, I can I can go back and uh, um, and uh, and have a cup of tea. So no, it's uh, good yeah. timing. Thank, thank you, Sean. Really, we really appreciate your time. Really. Okay. Thank, thanks for the opportunity to to, to help yeah, out. Thank you, and thank you, Selene. Also, really very well. Appreciate.